Welcome to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. Here you'll find the intersection between faith and mental health. I'm your host, Camille. I'm a licensed therapist and clinical social worker, but more importantly, I'm a Christian who really loves the Lord. And I'm just trying to navigate this life without falling victim to it, just like everyone else. Here we take a faith-based approach to all things mental health and wellness, because the Bible tells us to guard our heart and mind. And sometimes we need a little bit of help with that. Hi everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. My name is Camille. I'm your host. And as always, I'm so happy that you're here. I hope that you're doing all right and that you're having a good week. How's y'all summer going? We are in the middle of summer now. It's really hot where I'm at, but hopefully you're staying cool. It is, it's hot. It's hot. It's the summertime and it's hot, but we're doing all right over here. Okay. Um, I'm nervous about today's episode because I didn't want to record it. (laughs) Um, This topic, it's, a few people in my life have suggested that I talk about this and I haven't wanted to. Um, and what really prompted me to revisit the idea again is one of the questions that someone submitted. We're going to get to the question later on in the episode, but it was related to the same thing. And, um, I don't know, it's just been on my mind, just in my personal life lately. Um, and I feel like God is trying to he's trying to help me through it or he's trying to tell me something about it or teach me something. I don't know. And I get a lot of edification from doing this podcast and I've gotten a lot of personal revelation from it. And so I'm praying that today that I get some clarity and revelation, but also that everyone listening does as well. So today's episode is for my single girls. Of course, anyone is welcome to listen. We don't discriminate around here, but I'm talking to my single ladies today. There is an epidemic in the church community, and that epidemic is that there are so many single women who are seeking godly, like-minded partnership, and there just does not seem to be an equal amount of counterparts for us. And so we find ourselves in this this space that can be quite frustrating, Um, and I think that there are just, there's just a lot to that conversation about singleness. Um, as it relates to our walk, but also as it relates to our mental health, this is something that I see coming up in the therapy space about as much, well, maybe not as much, but a good amount similar to how I see it coming up in the church space. And the narrative is that there must be something wrong with me because I am single or because I don't have a partner. So some of the similarities that I see in the therapy space and in the church space is that we have this correlation between our relationship status and our self-worth and our value. And we seek validation, not only from other people, but specifically from romantic partnership. And that has been so damaging to myself and to a lot of other people. And I really want to free us from that. So... I have some thoughts on this and I was struggling with trying to really, I don't know, um, concretely conceptualize like where I wanted this episode to go, partly because I've been in an interesting space with my own singleness and I go up and down with it um, as I think most of us do. And so it was hard for me to like nail down exactly what needed to be said about this because I'm not really sure exactly what needs to be said about this. And so whenever I feel that way about a topic, I just jot a couple of things down and then I just let the Holy Spirit do the rest. And so that's, that's what we're going to do today. But I do want to speak to the experience of other single women in church, other single Christians, um, and other single women who are trying to get themselves together and who are trying to get themselves right. There's a lot of, of stigma surrounding relationship status, which when I think about it, it sounds, sounds pretty bizarre and it just has done so much damage. It continues to do a whole lot of damage to us. And I know that a lot of the content surrounding being single and you're in your, your single, your, your, your single season and in your waiting season, some of the, the rhetoric that comes in, in that packaging, I have not really found to be helpful. And sometimes I found to be a little bit, um, minimizing or dismissive or, um, I don't know, victimizing or too sympathetic. I don't know. Um, 
but oftentimes that content comes from people who are on the other side of their single season and now they are happily married and it's like they're reaching back to give us something. Those of us who are still over here single and waiting. I don't believe that that's the intent. And <laughs> before I started, part of my prayer before I started recording this was that I don't, that I don't come across as bitter because I think that that uh, is is how these conversations about singleness can be perceived at times. And if I'm honest, sometimes there maybe is a little, oh, I don't know. I don't know if bitterness, I have a hard time saying that I'm, that I'm bitter. I maybe have had moments of that, but there are some conflicting feelings. I think that exist when you're not only single, but when you've been single for a long time and when you're really trying to, uh, to approach relationships in a, a godly and intentional way. No, I guess there maybe have been some times where I've been a little bit bitter about it, but that hasn't been the, the overwhelming feeling. And so that's, I, I don't want that to, to be the undertone of this at all. Actually, you know what? I don't think I'm as worried about that because like I said, I'm talking to my other single girls. And so I really think that y'all will understand my heart in this more than maybe those who are not single. And maybe those of you who are not single who are watching this, my prayer, I think, is that maybe you'll get some insight into how your single friends are feeling into a little bit of uh, what they're walking through and what it's like to walk through it in the way that we are, especially today in 2024, uh, in the age of social media and online dating is listen, it's rough out here. <laughs> It's, it's rough out here. And I know that y'all want to support us. Y'all who are married or are partnered, I know that y'all want to support us. And so um, hopefully and prayerfully, this will maybe help you to support us in ways that that feel more supportive. I think this is one of the areas often where the intention and the impact don't always align. Uh, a lot of the folks in my life who uh, are married or are not single, um, when they are are speaking to me about it. I know that the intention is always good and that the intention is, well, I think that the intention is to um, help me to feel better about not being partnered, but it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't usually come across that way. And, um, and I know that y'all really love us and you want us to feel loved. Um, and I think that's where you're coming from a lot of the time. But I, I think that the the mark, I think that the mark has been missed in really supporting us in ways that make us feel supported. So my hope and prayer is that through maybe hearing a little bit more from my perspective as someone who's currently single and has some, some ups and downs and has struggled with it, that I'm, I'm hopeful that that perspective will give you some further insight into the single folks in your life and that that will help you to know how to support them in in some more effective ways. I'm also not sure exactly how personal I want to get on this episode. So this is my disclaimer now for anyone who may be a client of mine. Love y'all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. We don't have to talk about this. Matter of fact, let's not, okay? <laughs> so th I think that there is this cycle um, that, that we go through and I'm speaking specifically to, I think I'm speaking specifically to, uh, women who are pretty independent and who are uh, really intentional in most aspects of their life and who want to be really intentional in dating as well. If you are in adulthood, let's say like, I don't know, late twenties, early to mid thirties and you're single, then you know what it's like dating right now. You probably have had at least a couple of attempts on the dating apps. They likely have not gone well. I know that's not everyone's experience. I know I know people personally who have gotten married from folks that they met on dating sites. So I know that they can be successful. I know that that is not the norm. <laughs> I know that, uh, if, that, that if you have been on the dating apps, that it probably has exhausted you at some point. You probably have gone on and off of them 
you probably hop on for a couple of weeks or months at a time and then you got to take a break because it is exhausting. The last time that I that I tried to get on the dating apps when I first moved to Houston, I lasted nine days <laughs> on one app. I lasted nine days and I said, I'm out. I, I can't do this anymore. It's a pretty sp- specific experience, but if you know, you know. So you probably have gone through that a few times, but you want something that feels really intentional and that feels really real. There's a lot of surface level intimacy being offered to people. And we have gotten to a point where that's not what we want anymore. And we know that that's not what we deserve, but there's this interesting space that we find ourselves because Culturally, the expectation and the norm is that people partner off. That's how society has always worked. That's how people have worked. Biologically, that's how we work. We, we partner off. And we, most of us have grown up with the idea and understanding and plan that we're going to grow up and get married. And for some folks, we're going to grow up, get married and have kids and start a family. And so now we find ourselves, we've done the grown up part. And so now it's time for the settle down, get married and start a family part. And for a lot of us, we've been able to be successful on our own. We've been able to be successful professionally, financially. We maybe have have been able to purchase homes. We have thriving friendships. Uh, we have gotten our skincare together. We finally found a routine that works. We're working on our physical health. We're working on our mental health. We're very intentional. And then there's this whole concept of dating. And we probably have tried to be intentional there. But when it doesn't work, we naturally start to think about ourselves. Because if I've been able to successfully make these things happen in all these other areas, why have I not been able to successfully make things happen in this specific area? So that takes our thought process to a place where we start to question and doubt ourselves and we start to question and doubt our worthiness, our sense of value, our capabilities, our lovability. And that leads us to a place of considering maybe adjusting some of our standards that we have, adjusting some of our standards or being, or being more aggressive in our search and in really getting to a place where we feel like we need to find someone and we need to make partnership happen for ourselves. That feels like the missing piece for a lot of people. That feels like the thing that will make me not feel like a failure anymore. That will make me less lonely. And I think that there is this cycle that we get into and we, we go back and forth between, I really, really want someone in my life and I feel like there's something wrong with me for not being able to have someone in my life. And then the other side of that is that we find peace in our singleness because we know and believe that there's a season for everything and that God is, that God has someone for us, but either we or the other person is not ready yet. And that God is trying to do some things in me individually before I'm ready for my spouse or for my partner. And so we, we know that there must be some intention in the singleness as well. And so we find some peace in that and we lean into all the good parts about being single. We know that there are great things about being single. There are pros and cons of every situation of every circumstance that you're in. So we lean into the pros of being single and we say, you know what? I don't really have to worry about nobody else right now. I don't have to consider anybody else right now. I can come and go as I please. So I'm just going to do all the things that I want to do while I'm in my season of waiting. And I'm just going to go and have a good time. Maybe I'm going to date myself. I'm going to hang out with my friends. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to whatever. We find other things to take up our time, to distract ourselves, sometimes to distract ourselves from the fact that we are single. And other times... We, we really are able to find a, a, a sense of peace and joy and contentment in our independence. Maybe a little bit too much sometimes. <laughs> I always say, you know, the, the longer I'm on my own and the longer I'm like single and not obligated to anyone, the harder I think it's going to be for me if and when I do find somebody to actually know how to kind of compromise in that way. But I digress and that's besides the point. 
But we find ourselves typically in one of those two headspaces. Either I really, really want someone. God, why haven't you found someone for me? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do differently? Why am I not attracting the right kind of people? And then we go back to, you know what? I don't want to force nothing. What's for me is for me. I know that God hasn't forgotten about me. It's just me and God in this season. And that's the sweetest relationship that I can have. And so I have peace and contentment there. We kind of go back and forth between the two. And I don't think it's intentional. At least for me, it's never intentional. I would love to stay in the very peaceful and joyful place and contentment with just me and God. But I'd be going back and forth too. And I hate going back to that other place. I mean, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I hate getting to that place where the thought of a relationship becomes central for me again. But I think that's what happens. I think that there are times where the thought of being in a relationship really takes up so much brain space. And we ruminate on this idea of finding someone, finding someone, finding someone. And that subconsciously becomes the objective every time we leave the house. I wonder if I'm going to meet somebody today. I got to walk to the mailbox. Maybe I'll meet somebody walking their dog and maybe they'll fall in love with me. I got to go to the gym. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll see somebody or they'll, they'll see me uh, on the squat rack and they're just going to think that I'm so strong and they're going to come up to me and fall in love with me (laughs) every time we leave the house. It's exhausting. (laughs) It's exhausting. And so I've really appreciated a lot of the the things that I've seen and heard about decentering men or decentering the idea of being in a relationship. Because when you're in that place where it feels central, it really does feel like it eclipses so much else. And I have found that, at least personally, I that it feels disrespectful to myself that that's my primary thought is, am I going to meet somebody? Am I going to find somebody? It feels like I'm... Uh, rejecting and neglecting so much else about my life that it's all come down to whether or not I'm in a relationship with someone that's kind of crazy to me and then of course we go through through things in life that are really hard and really heavy and really chaotic and really painful and I think it's in those times that our singleness really starts to feel like a burden because who wants to go through that kind of stuff alone nobody And yes, we have family. Yes, we have friends. Yes, we have loved ones. But there are different types of love. There are, I think, eight different types of love. In the Greek, we hear about agape a whole lot and phileo and all these different types of love. And so we have friendships and we have family and we have really meaningful and nurturing relationships. But there is a romantic type of love that we don't have. And there is a certain type of intimacy that comes in that kind of partnership that we don't have. And for, uh, for a lot of us, that type of intimacy is something that we really yearn and that we really crave because that is the type of intimacy that would really allow us to fully recline and to fully release and, uh, and that it, and, and it would provide a type of support and someone holding space for you in a way that, that other people's that other people are not able to, at least that's, that's the idea. And that's the, that's the dream. (laughs) And so in those seasons, when things are really, really hard, singleness starts to feel like more of a burden. And I think that's when it starts to become more centralized. So depending on what's going on in our life, we, we, we wax and wane between the, the single mindsets, I think. But when that, when that singleness feels like a burden, I think it's really difficult. It's a hard thing to even really verbalize that, that space and that, and that feeling. It's not just that we don't want to be single anymore. There have been times where I've more than that desired to not want to be partnered anymore. Like God, take the desire away from me because this desire feels like a burden. The desire to be with someone feels like it's bringing more pain. So take the desire away from me. I don't even want to want it anymore. That's been my prayer a lot of the time. God, if I'm supposed to be single, then why do I want a relationship? Take that want away from me. Don't even let me want it anymore so that I can just settle into where you have me and settle into where I'm supposed to be. And I really have, I think God and I 
God and I have an understanding. I think he knows how my, how my brain works. I believe that if God has not removed this desire from my heart, then it must be, it must be for me at some, at some point and in some way. And I think a lot of us believe that because we know that, uh, the Bible says that it's not good for man to be alone and that, uh, and, and, and that the, the design is that, uh, we, we grow to a point of maturity and then we start building a life with someone else and we be fruitful and multiply and all of that. And that's what has been taught to us from such a young age. And I think especially women and especially in the church, it has been hammered into us that that is what we're to do. We're to grow up and find a man. And if we have not found one, something must be wrong with us. Something must be wrong with us if we have not found a man or if they haven't found us. I add that part if they haven't found us because that's what we're, that's what's supposed to happen. But usually what, what, what I hear from other people is what's wrong with you because you have not found a man. And honestly, I think that's probably where some of the bitterness comes in. If anything, it's, it's in this responsibility that is placed on women to make yourself desirable enough so that someone will want you. And that I think is what really contributes to this damaging mindset that if we are single, then there is something wrong with us. And we, we, we refer to that, our singleness as the, the thorn in the flesh. And this is just the thing that we've been burdened with. And this is the baggage that we carry that we're single. Now, of course, I'm sure this, this probably is not the case for some people. And like I said earlier, that, that, that's not always the case for most of us. There are seasons where we are really able to stand strong and stand firm in our singleness and in our independence. But I think that even in doing so, there's a part of us that questions whether or not we're ever going to be able to find somebody, whether or not we are cut out to be in relationship with people, whether or not we're good enough or worthy enough. And maybe we try to convince ourselves that it's okay and I don't really want it. And we really try to protect ourselves from some of the grief and heartbreak that comes from seeing everyone else around you, finding someone and really being happy in that. Well, hold on. I know everybody's not really happy in it and that we don't know what goes on in people's households and that everyone is not always as happy as they seem. But the other damaging thing is that because there is so much value placed on relationships, a lot of, a lot of us have adjusted our standards and a lot of people have settled for things that are unsafe and unhealthy for the sake of being with someone. Now, I thank God for delivering me from, from being there. And in that mindset, I surely have put up with some things that I shouldn't have for the sake of having someone won't do it again, though. That's honestly what brings me back to the peace and contentment of my singleness, because I've gotten to that space where you have to be better than my peace. And if you disrupt my peace, then ah. What are we, what are we actually doing? <laughs> what are we doing? I've gotten to the place of really believing and standing on the fact that, that if you're coming into my life, it's because you're bringing something good and not because you're here to like, just make things worse. <laughs> I don't think that's what God has for me. That's not to say that I'm under any delusion that relationships are going to be easy at all. It's the opposite. In fact, I know that they're going to be a whole lot of hard work. Most of us know that relationships are going to be hard work. I don't think we're under any delusion that they won't be. And I know for me, I've been saying for a long time, um, I, I, I want to be with someone who wants to put the work in with me because I want to put the work in with somebody else because I know that it's going to be work and that it takes work. So we, we, we know that. Okay. But still, because we have had the opportunity to really kind of curate these other pieces of our life to benefit us so much. It's, it's hard thinking about somebody coming in and disrupting all that and bringing like nothing but more pain. How are you being a helpmate to me? If that's, if that's what's going on, how are you being my protector and my covering? If that's what we're doing, (laughs) we've, we've lost the plot, but I do, I do think, well, and know that we will often overlook things or make excuses for things or just put up with a whole lot in relationships for the sake of being in one. 
And I really want to deliver us from that as well. I, I, I want us to be delivered and find our deliverance from that. But something that I think we carry a lot of shame about that, that we should not carry shame about is the fact that we do desire partnership. And I think that shame maybe is what has led me to those prayers of asking God to take, to remove that desire from me. And I think that shame comes from the, the feelings of inadequacy for not being able to find or sustain a healthy relationship. And so, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's, it's, it's going to happen when you're least expecting it. It's when you stop looking, that's when they come into your life. When you stop looking, that's when God's going to bring them into your life. So then we try to convince ourselves that we don't want it and that we're not looking. <laughs> we try to gaslight ourselves and God into thinking that, okay, God, I'm not expecting it. So that means it must be coming, right? It's it's weird, but there is this this kind of feeling of like, we we should not put so much emphasis on relationships because they don't define us and they shouldn't define us. But then there's still that part of me that really wants to be in one. And so that can be a confusing place to be. And that can bring a lot of shame too. But it's okay to want to be with someone. Multiple things can be true. I say that about a ton of stuff. Multiple things can be true. I can want to be with someone. I can want and desire a healthy God-led relationship and I can find contentment and gratitude in my singleness because that's where I am. It's not the easiest place to find, to, to find yourself, but it's possible to get there. But in order to get there, we have to accept and acknowledge and be okay with wanting to be in a relationship. And I think that is a part of the, uh, of the intended encouragement that we get from some of the non-single people in our life. The encouragement being, oh girl, you don't want to be in a relationship. Trust me. It's just a whole lot of work and it's just this and it's just that. That is the encouragement sometimes that we get, but that's some of the encouragement that doesn't really land. That's the encouragement that actually brings shame because that doesn't make me want a relationship less. I know there's going to be work. I know that that man gets on your nerves. I know that y'all argue and that he don't clean up after himself. I know. And <laughs> I still desire, maybe not, maybe not what somebody else has like specifically, but I still desire partnership and relationship. And so some of that encouragement, that intended encouragement, I think has contributed to some of the shame. My heart really breaks for women who have internalized the inability to find and sustain healthy, secure relationships, because I just really believe that there are so many other variables that go into it. It is not, it has never been as simple as the romance novels and movies make it seem. The meat cutes don't be meat cuting in real life. <laughs> We, we don't meet and fall in love immediately and just know it doesn't happen that way. There are so many other things that, that need to be considered and that actually go into play. Honestly, a big part of it is the lack of like-minded counterparts available to us. And I'm trying to be really sensitive in some of this vernacular that I'm using because I think this part of the conversation is what makes us come across as bitter. We'll say, oh, well, there's no good men available. So that's why I'm single because there ain't no good men. And, da, 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 da. and so I want to be really intentional in, in the way that I'm delivering this part of it. Because it's not just that there aren't any men available or any men who don't want to be single. I'm talking specifically about like-minded and intentional people. Like-minded spiritually but also like-minded personally and compatible emotionally, compatible financially, whatever that means for you, compatible recreationally. There are a lot of different points of compatibility and the older we get and the longer we're single, the more aware we become of all these different points of compatibility. Some people who find themselves uh, partnered and married very young 
I think that later in life, they struggle with some of these other parts of compatibility that maybe they weren't aware of when they were younger or that had not been fully developed yet when they're younger. And so they struggle. But when you're single and you're out of your 20s and you're much more like aware of who you are and maybe the kind of people that you would be compatible with, then the available pool of counterparts begins to shrink. I hope that I'm, I hope that I'm, that I'm making sense. And I'm, I really want to communicate this with, with compassion, because I do know that there are some men who are single and intentional. I don't know where they are, but I know that they exist. <laughs> Show yourselves. <laughs> Show yourselves. <laughs> but that is a, a real thing that has to be considered in this conversation about dating and relationships and singleness. What do the prospects look like? <laughs> not And not physically, I'm really not talking about physically. Like I'm barely talking about physical appearance. Attraction matters, but attraction grows and changes over time. So that's, that's not, that's, that, that's really not number one, two or three on what I think we need to be prioritizing. Well, I guess depending on the person, let me not, okay. Um, I, I, I say all that to say there are a lot of different variables that come into play when we are on the scene and when we're trying to be intentional about finding uh, meaningful romantic relationships. But a lot of those things I think are either left out of the conversation or are, um, dismissed from the conversation. And even in knowing that there are so many other variables, somehow we still tend to, uh, take on a lot of the responsibility personally, that there must be something wrong with me. If I haven't been able to find a man or keep a man, I've, I've spoken before about, um, my kind of journey with self-acceptance and self-confidence. And I really hate to admit that a part of why I struggled had to do with my relationship experiences or lack of relationship experiences. And even even that, I, I hate that my relationship status or relationship experiences were able to have so much of an impact on how I viewed myself, especially when I was younger. I find that just to be so cruel to young girls. I find that to be so cruel that in middle school, in high school, in college, I felt bad about myself because the boys didn't want to talk to me or because I didn't get asked out to the school dance. And I don't think that should have been the case, but it was, and I think it continues to be. But on my journey of self-acceptance, I had to sit with the singleness and I had to sit with the fact that I am who I am, regardless of if other people see it, but it is really difficult to get to a place of true self-acceptance and self-love when we are simultaneously experiencing direct or indirect rejection from people, not just people, but from our, from our counterparts who we have been conditioned to want to do life with. So the people that I want to do life with don't want to do life with me. That's a kind of rejection that can do a lot of damage, can do a whole lot of damage. Now, of course, we got to take some accountability <laughs> in the kind of people that we think we want to do life with, because like we said earlier, we tend to adjust those standards and we tend to settle and not in the good way for, uh, for, for people that we know we're not compatible with. And we tend to ignore some of those red flags. So as we're, as we're thinking about the people that don't want to, don't want to do life with us, we also have to ask whether or not we should really want to do life with those people. So I just had to put that in there. <laughs> it is so natural for us to want love. Everybody wants love. We're not meant to to do life alone. I don't I don't think that everyone is meant to be married or partnered and there are some people who do not desire that and are very happy to not be. And I think I love that for y'all. And then there are those of us who try to convince ourselves that we're very happy to not be partnered and that we're very happy to be single. But deep down, we know that we, we, well, that we do crave that for ourselves and it's okay to crave that all humans want love. All humans need love. 
All humans need companionship. I do think that we tend to overlook some of the other types of love in our life because we're missing this one. And so a part of my encouragement would be to assess the other relationships that you have in your life. Not that they're going to take the place of a romantic one, but I think sometimes we need to be reminded that we are loved because of some of the messaging that comes from, from being single internal or external. Uh, but I think that we, we need that reminder sometimes that we are lovable and that we are loved and whether we like it or not, we get a lot of that from other people. So we know that we shouldn't need that, that external validation that we need other people to, you know, to tell us that who we are or, or what we deserve, but that's just the way that our mind works sometimes. And so I know that I even have to uh, sit back and really think about how blessed I am with how much love is in my life. I have a lot of people who love me. I have a lot of people who I love and that's truly a blessing. So it is natural to want and desire love. I think it's natural to want and desire romantic love, romantic and intimate love. I think that is very natural and that's very okay. We are commanded to love one another. So I'm literally just trying to be obedient. <laughs> I'm trying to find somebody to give all this love to (laughs) because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Okay. I'm just trying to be obedient. God gives us so many examples of love. He himself is the example of perfect love. And as I was, um, thinking about, about doing this episode, like outside of this, I've been thinking a lot about the fruits of the spirit and, um, had kind of decided to start uh, on, on a study or a series just on the fruits of the spirit. And so simultaneously, as I'm thinking about doing this episode about singleness and dating, I also am thinking about the fruits of the spirit. And so I said, well, let me just start with the fruits of the spirit and see where it gets me. And the first fruit of the spirit is love. So I said, you know what? Okay. Maybe it's some, some sort of divine intervention too. So I started really looking into like love and what does that mean? And and what does that look like? And love has kind of two functions. One is that love is the primary characteristic of God. And then secondly, love is something that, that we do and a value that we, that, that we hold as Christians. But I want to focus on love as a primary characteristic of God. What does that mean? What, what does that look like? I think that means that we ought to love one another the way that God loves us, but also that we should look for people who love us the way that God loves us. So when we're thinking about maybe accepting less than what we want or less than what we deserve, I think that we need to really base our definition on what we're looking for or what we are accepting from other people. I think we need to base that on the love that God has for us and on the love that God shows us. He shows us this in his personhood because that's how we ought to be loving one another. And that type of love is available to us from other people. I think in general, we, we have a, a love problem when a problem with loving one another. Well, any kind of love, but as we are in our, in, in the waiting and as we're kind of vacillating between really wanting and desiring relationship and being peaceful and content with God, I think that it's important to get really clear on the kind of love that that God has for us and on the kind of love that God wants us to receive from other people, because it's the kind of love that's, that's worth like holding out for. And it's the kind of love that I don't want to pass me by because I settled for something else so that I wouldn't be lonely anymore. So the, the first thing that I noticed and that we see is that God's love for us is active. God draws us closer to him. He actively pulls us closer to him because he wants us to be closer to him. Now, when I think about some of my dating experiences, one of the, I think, biggest disservices that I have done to myself is in trying to convince someone to be with me or to stay with me or to love me in trying to um, entice someone. And we do that, I think through like our, our shape shifting and our people pleasing. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, I have in my own way really tried to chase people. 
Um, girl, I just think back to, to my younger self, um, and, and in how much I tried to be what I thought, uh, somebody else who I was interested in wanted me to be because I wanted them to be interested in me. Like I was interested in them, but God is active in his pursuit of us, which means that somebody who is going to love me is going to be active in their pursuit of me. That's not going to be a one-sided pursuit because as God is pursuing me, I'm trying to actively pursue him as well, but I don't have to convince God to love me. It's kind of crazy because I don't deserve that love, but he gives it to me freely and he wants to give, he wants to give that love to me. So God's love is active. He's active in his pursuit of us and people that we are doing life with and people that, that we're wanting to have that kind of intimate relationship with, they ought to be actively pursuing that type of intimacy with us as well. We should not have to try to manipulate other people to want to be with us. I should not have to try to change who I am so that you'll want to be here with me. That's, that's the, that's the temptation. A lot of the time is, Oh, well, if I just present myself like this, then maybe they'll, they'll want to be with me, but that's not how God loves us. That's not how the spouse that God has for you is going to love you. God's love is also unconditional and unwavering. He loves me the same as he did yesterday, the same as he's going to tomorrow. You know that song, Jaira, and it says, I've never been more loved than I am right now. God has always loved us the same amount. It has not changed and it will not change no matter what we do. And we sin against him all the time. And that love that he has for us never changes. It is unconditional. And that's the kind of love that our spouse ought to have for us. A love that is unconditional. Now, I know that that does not always look the same. It's not going to look the same every day. We may not always like each other, but... We ought to always love one another. When love is conditional, it feels so fragile. And that's when you find yourself walking on eggshells. And if we have shapeshifted and changed ourselves to, to make someone believe that they love us, then that love is very conditional. It's based on the condition that we remain this person that we have presented ourselves to be in order to entice them to want to be in a relationship with us. So we're setting ourselves up for a conditional love when we do that, when we chase people who don't want to be chased, when we chase people who do not see us or who, who don't like us, when we chase those people, then that love immediately becomes conditional. It's based on the condition that we maintain that representative that we showed them in order to entice us to be here. God is not interested in our representative. God wants real intimacy with us, with the, the, the true us and his love is unconditional knowing who we are, knowing who we are in our unedited format that can that love is unconditional and unwavering and that's the kind of love that we should expect from other people too that's not too much to ask God's love is very intentional it's not accidental it's not mindless it's not frivolous he loves us because he wants to because he chooses to it is a choice God chooses to love us in spite of our sin he chooses to love us even when it, it maybe would not be convenient. And so when we talk about dating and we throw around this term intentional a lot, and we want to, to date with a level of intention and we want somebody else who's dating intentionally. I was texting one of my friends the other day and I was like, we're having an intentional girl summer. <laughs> Forget how girl summer, intentional girl summer is in. But that means that it's on purpose. And that means that it's not coincidental and that it may not always be convenient and that we are willing to put effort into it. We know that there's effort that has to go into it. And so the other person ought to be able and willing to put in an equal amount of effort. They should also want to put in effort. So it's not just because we happen to be here or because uh, I'm, I'm tired of, of being by myself and you're here and I'm here, so we might as well. There's no intention in that. God is very intentional with us. God don't play about me. And so my spouse ain't going to play about me either. The person that God has for me and the person that loves me the way that God loves me is not going to play about me either. Okay. God's love is sacrificial. Now, I don't expect my spouse to die for me necessarily, but I do expect them 
to be sacrificial in their love for me. And let me also say that all of these things, when I'm talking about how God loves us and how somebody else should love us, what I'm also saying is this is how we should be loving other people. So this is the kind of love that I'm willing to give to someone who is willing to give this kind of love to me. And when we have these kinds of expectations and standards, and when this is what we're looking for, I do think that that kind of shrinks the pool of available people because everyone is not approaching relationships in this way, even though we should be. God is very clear in the fact that we should be loving each other the way that he loves us. And we miss the mark. We miss the mark in our friendships and in our families and with our children and with our spouses. And so this is not just for those of us who are single and wanting relationship, but this is for anybody who has any kind of relationship with anybody else. This is the kind of love that we ought to be showing. Okay. So I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not just expecting someone to be sacrificial for me and I'm not willing to be sacrificial for them either. Not at all. Like I said earlier, I'm going to be sacrificing a part of my peace anyway <laughs> for by, by the mere sake of being in a relationship, I'm sacrificing something, but God's love is sacrificial. That means, again, it's not always convenient and that maybe we might have to let go of some things that that matter to us for the sake of somebody else who matters to us. That's going to look different in your relationship and in your own walk. That's going to look different. But God's love towards us is extremely sacrificial. And so we do need to sometimes be self-sacrificing when we're in relationships, sacrificing our time maybe. Uh, maybe sacrificing some of our own comfortability, right? But that might look like sacrificing uh, your discomfort with my vulnerability so that you can be that safe space for me. Maybe that's what that sacrifice looks like. That sacrifice might look like instead of buying that new pair of shoes, you give me a birthday gift. Like <laughs> it's crazy that that's a sacrifice, but maybe that, maybe that's what it is, whatever. Okay. But sacrificial, someone who's willing to sacrifice for us, big or small, honestly, again, I'm not willing, I'm, I'm not expecting you to lay down your life for me. Maybe when we're married, I might, but that's because I would, if, if we're, if we're really married and we're really in this thing together, then I would probably lay my life down for you too. So I guess I would expect that, but we're not even close to that yet. And then lastly, God's love is reliable. It's consistent. You can count on it. You can bet on it. I don't doubt that God loves me and that he's going to love me. I don't want to have to doubt that. I don't have any question about the way that God feels about me. There is no ambiguity in my relationship with God and in, in the way that God loves me and the fact that he loves me as much as he does. There is no ambiguity there. There is no gray area. There is no doubt about it. That doubt, that ambiguity, that, that grayness, that unreliability, that's something that I am simply not willing to put up with in romantic relationships anymore at all. If you don't know how you feel about me, then I think you know how you feel about me. This may have come from some of my own experiences and I know that relationships, you know, are, are kind of fluid and that things are not as black and white. Sure. I know that. I do know that. Sure. But if one day you love me and the next day you don't, then you don't love me. That's just, how, that's just what it is. That's just what it is because that's not what God shows. God's love is reliable. It is consistent. You can take it to the bank. There is security in that. And that security and that stability is something that we should expect from the people that, that we're seeking romantic and intimate relationships with. So those, those five things, that's what I think we should be looking for and expecting and waiting for. That's what we're waiting for. And when it's laid out like that, when I think about it like that, I am willing to wait for something like that. And I'm not willing to accept something that does not look like that. Call me picky if you want to. I don't think any of that is too much to ask. God wouldn't tell us to love each other that way if it was too much to ask, if it wasn't possible, if it wasn't reasonable, that would not be the commandment. God is not going to tell us to do something that we're not capable of doing. So that's the standard. How that materializes for you and for the people in your life 
That's, that's between you and God, but that is the standard. That's it. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the reminder that, that God has been, is, is trying to give me because I'm telling y'all, I've, I've been in a really like, I don't know, weird place with my singleness lately. If I've been like really trying to get back to that peaceful place and really trying to get back to like not centering the idea of relationships and like, I don't want to think about it so much. And I don't want that to always be the objective when I leave the house. And I really been trying to get back to that peaceful place with me and God. And so maybe that, that is, is the reminder that I needed is that if it doesn't look like this, then I simply don't want it anyway. And I think it's the reminder that there are people in my life who love me like this. There are people in my life who love me the way that God loves me. And that is a blessing because I know everybody don't have that. So that's a blessing in itself. But if it don't look like that, then I don't want it. (laughs) I don't want it no way. Now, let me also say that while I can say that with my full chest and I'm, I'm standing 10 toes on it, if it don't look like that, I don't want it. That doesn't make me less lonely. And a part of the temptation that, that we feel part of the temptation that makes us want to settle and accept less than that is loneliness. This type of loneliness, it's just really lonely. (laughs) It's just so lonely. And it really, it really does come up a lot when we're going through things and when we just want that that person to just be there. I don't have to, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sitting here struggling, trying to verbalize what, what it is that, that we are, are seeking that other people aren't able to offer. And I don't even know if I can really verbalize it because I don't have it, <laughs> but it's, it just, it gets to be really lonely. And I say that being somebody who is blessed to have a lot of people who love me. And there are times where I feel a, a, a certain type of loneliness when I'm going through things with my family or in my family. I don't have that other person who I know I can debrief with at the end of the day and who is going to be concerned about, uh, about, about my well, well being, um, and who is simply going to hold space for me all the time. Um, and who is just always in my corner. I don't have a partner to go through it with. And I think that's why we go back to that term partnership, because that really is what it is. It's like, I'm playing singles tennis while everybody else is playing doubles. I'm still playing tennis and sure, like I'm still, you know, having a good time and I'm still getting that good exercise, but it's like, I'm having to do, I'm having to, to, to cover all of it by myself instead of having somebody to help me cover it or to cover other parts of it with me. And that loneliness can feel so incredibly heavy. That's the best word that I have for it. And it's a type of weight that your friends can't always relieve for you and that your family can't always relieve for you. Now it's, it's even heavier if you don't have good support around you and if you don't have a a village and community around you. And I know that there are some people that fall into that category that are single and who don't have close friendships or family who is supportive. And so I really want to hold some space for y'all and my heart really goes, goes out to you all who feel that loneliness on an even deeper level that I can't even imagine. And this loneliness exists even, even though we know that God is always with us. And I think that's also a part of the reason that I have felt shame because I know that God's always with me. And so I shouldn't be lonely. So why am I lonely? If you know, I know that God's here and because I know that God is with me and I want there to be a a person to partner with me in doing life. And maybe that's, that, that's a part of it that I still, you know, struggle with sometimes. Um, there have been times where I have had to kind of like confess and repent for feeling like God is not enough for me because he is. And that's the truth that I need to come back to, to, to like reestablish that peace 
God is enough for me because I know that whatever I'm, I'm in and going through that he's going to carry me through it. I know that. And I don't doubt that because of his love that is unconditional and unchanging and reliable and intentional because of that. I know that I do know that. And it can be kind of hard to find some balance between that sometimes between knowing that truth and feeling that truth and in wanting someone to do life with you and someone to, to be a partner in it. But I think because I know that God is there and because of the kind of partnership that he shows me, that's what sets the standard for somebody else. So that loneliness is a part of the temptation that we feel to settle. Another part of it is comparison. My goodness. I'm in my, my mid thirties and everyone around me is married or getting married. Everyone around me is partnered off or partnering off. I'm I'm finding in, in this season of my life that my, my friendships with other single people are, are a lot more important to me, not more important than my, my friendships with other people who are not single, but they hold uh, a, a very necessary place in my life because I think that there's a, there's, there's a, there's a camaraderie there's a level of understanding. Um, I don't talk very much about my, my singleness or how I feel being single with other people who are not single, because what I often get is that sympathy and that, uh, intended encouragement that doesn't feel too encouraging. Uh, and I, I think that it maybe makes people feel, I don't know, bad for me or, um, I don't know actually what it makes people feel, but I, 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 I find that there is a, a different level of, of understanding. I don't know. Um, but that comparison is, is, is natural, of course. And I am so happy. I'm so incredibly happy for the people in my life who have found this type of love. I am so happy for them and I'm rooting for all of them. And I am their biggest cheerleader. I'm a hopeless romantic. So I love love. Okay. I I love love and I love it for those around me. And that comparison between looking at everyone around me who has found love and who has partnered off and then looking at myself, it, it, it naturally makes me think about, well, what am I doing differently or am I doing something differently? Even though a, a lot of them, I feel like they have found the person that is for them. And maybe it just comes down to God has not brought, you know, me and my person together or, or whatever it is. But like, I, I have to, you know, remind myself of that so much when I'm surrounded by folks who have, who are no longer single. I have to maybe like work harder to, to, to not allow myself to go into that thought process. When I'm around my single friends, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to think about that at all. And so I'm, I'm finding a, a lot of value in my, in my friendships with other single people, because it's a, it's a shared experience that we have right now. Other people in my life who are not single, maybe at one point you shared in this experience with me and right now you don't, and that's okay. That's all right. And I know that you still love me and I still love you, but it's just a little bit different. Um, and I think that it, it, it combats that comparison. So if you're also in this space, make sure that you keep some other single folks around you, find some other single people that needs to be a part of your community as well. Cause we tired of being third and fifth and seventh wheels. <laughs> we love y'all. Y'all married people. We love y'all, but we tired of that. <laughs> and then the, the, the last thing that makes us really want to settle is this feeling of unworthiness. I just can't state enough how we just have been so deceived in believing that our worthiness comes from our relationship status. God has already determined our worth before we existed. He knew us in our mother's womb and he already saw value in us. Yet somehow that has gotten lost in our search for partnership and in our search for relationships. That's gotten lost or we don't feel that or we're like, yeah, 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 we know that. But, and so that worthiness, that inherent worthiness that God has given to us gets minimized and diminished because we're single. That's a slap in the face to God. 
I'm saying to God, you're wrong. And I'm actually not as valuable as you say that I am, because if I were that valuable, other people would see it too. So how come other people don't see it, God? How come it's, it's, it's not real until other people can see it and other people can validate that for me? But if God said it, then it is so. God says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God says that we are precious in his sight. God already said it. We have to find that truth somewhere in us. We have to find a way for that truth to become real and to exist in our reality. However, we can do that. Maybe, maybe we need to get back into our self-love bag. And maybe instead of self-love, think about you reminding yourself of God's love for you. We have a hard time sometimes setting aside time to spend with ourselves and like take ourselves on a date. But what if you looked at that as your time with God? Then could we do it? Like then could we prioritize it? So I, I want us to start thinking about self-love as God love. I'm, I want to show myself the kind of love that God shows me because he said that I'm worthy of it. And even if someone else is not being intentional about giving me that love, God is giving me that love and I can be intentional about giving myself that love as well. There's a whole part of this conversation that has to do with how we feel about ourselves, especially when we, when we talk about worthiness and, and value and where we place our value and what, and how we deem our own, our own level of worthiness. But God already said it. And we have to find a way to make that feel true for us because that truth is not going to change that God already sees you as worthy and as valuable. So whatever that's going to take to make it true for you, we, we got to find a way. We, we have to find a way because that's going to detach our sense of worthiness from our relationship status. And that's going to make it easier for us to, to stand firm in our intentionality when we're seeking relationships with other people. Okay. Um, I think that there, I, I have, I have so many thoughts about this because of course I think about it a lot. So there are probably a lot of other things that I, there are probably a lot of other things that I could say about it, but I don't think we have time to really get into all of my thoughts about it. So we're going to move on to our scripture of the day. Um, and we are, we're, we're going to see what God has to say about some of this. Okay. Today's scripture is coming from first John chapter four, verse seven through eight. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. When we talk about being intentional about finding like-minded people, we're talking about finding people to partner with who love God and who really know God. We're talking about finding people who know God in a personal and intimate way. They say that to be loved is to be seen. If someone does not know and love God personally and intimately, then they're not going to love you well. They're not going to see you well. Because I think that the way that this is supposed to go is that the God in you is supposed to see the God in me and we're supposed to love the God in one another. But if there is no God in you, if there is no real true love in you, there's no God in you. Then how is the God in me? supposed to really find love, but also how is it, how is it supposed to have that, that vessel to pour love into when, when we talk about finding someone to lead and there's a whole conversation about submission and like, what does that actually mean? And the, the design is that we want, we really, first of all, we really want to submit like biblical submission. We really, we really want to let somebody lead, like we're tired of doing all of it. Okay. My, my fellow like hyper independent girlies, I know that we're tired of doing it all and we want somebody else to come on in and help us do it. But like Jill Scott said, if you can't tell me what to do, you can't tell me what to do. We want to follow somebody who is following God. And so it's important that the person that we're seeking for this partnership, for this life partnership, for this romantic partnership, it's important that they know God and that God is the head of their lives because that is going to make it so much easier for us to submit to them and to allow them to lead us. But if, if someone is not being intentional in their walk and in their relationship with God, then how can I expect them to be intentional with me? I can't, I can't. Not in the way that I want to be intentional with somebody else. Not in the way that I'm intentional in my walk with God. 
And so if that means that there are less people available to me, that's okay. I don't need a bunch of people available to me. I only need one. I don't know where he is or what he's doing, but I pray for him. And I know that God is doing the work in him. And I pray that he's growing in his relationship with God as I'm growing in mine. Because if we're both doing that work independently of one another, then that work is not going to stop when we come together. And I think that's what makes for healthy and stable and secure, like-minded, God-led relationships. The, there's so much temptation to settle for less than that. We convince ourselves all the time that we can put up with X, Y, or Z, or that it isn't that bad, or that I don't need someone to have the same beliefs about me in this area or in that area. Mm -mm. The Bible talks about being equally yoked in our relationships in general, period. And of course that applies as well to, to partnerships, romantic partnerships and spouses, but you can recognize it by knowing God for yourself and by knowing the love of God for yourself. If you don't know that, then you're not going to recognize it in somebody else. And that's how we're going to keep falling for these counterfeits. Okay. We can't do that no more. We're tired of that. We are tired of that. So look for the love of God in other people. And look for other people to show you the love of God. Until then, we got to love on one another. Until then, we have to find ways to really embrace the way that God is currently loving us. Even, even past that. And maybe we're single because we have not fully embraced the way that God is loving us. Maybe God knows that if he brought a person into our life, that we would forget about him. I don't know what it is. I don't know. And really right now I'm trying to stop understanding why I'm trying to stop finding reasons that are logical and that make sense to me. And I'm just trusting that God has not forgotten about me. I know he hasn't forgotten about me. It's, it's not, it's not always easy being single. It's just not. And there have been times where that has impacted my walk and my relationship with God. And I don't want that to happen. I don't, Mm -mm. I don't, I don't want to give anything that much power, especially the idea of something that does not even exist. That's idolatry. And I have, I have really had to repent and I have been guilty of idolizing a relationship and we have got to get away from that. We have to be honest about it. First of all, is your singleness getting in the way of your relationship with God? Is that becoming more important than your relationship with God? Are you idolizing relationships? Is that why you're settling for less than what God wants for you? We need to realign and reevaluate the things that we're prioritizing. God wants us to be loved the way that he loves us. That is the only way that he wants us to be loved. If it don't look like that, it's not of God and it's not love, period. Okay. Okay. Um, that's a good segue. That's going to lead us into our question of the day. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have a question that you want to be answered on the show, you can send me an email at therapy and prayer at gmail.com. You can uh, leave a comment on social media at therapy and prayer or wherever you are watching or listening to this. Okay. So today's question was actually, a, was a part of the inspiration for this whole episode. So thank you to whoever sent it. Um, but this question says, um, I need help. I feel like God is mad and is tired of me because of how many times I have fallen into temptation because I find it hard to stay single. And I don't know why I find it easy to fall into lust because I just want to be loved by the men I do things with. So I tend to do those things to make them stay. How do I get out of this bad habit and get it straight and right with God and to be a better woman, to know my purpose and to have a relationship with him? I just, I just feel like we all can relate so much to that whole entire thing. I, I think first of all, that, uh, we have really confused lust for love. We have confused attraction for love. We have confused infatuation for love. So first things first is that we need to make that distinction between lust and love. Now, lust specifically, right? We know that one of the, of the three categories of sin is the lust of the flesh. And so if you have a problem with lust, if that is a sin that you specifically struggle with, then that's something to really take to God and to, sur and to surrender to him um, and allow him to purify you in, in that way. Um, 
but I don't know if it's, if, if it's just the, the, the physical temptation that you feel, because it sounds like it's more than that. It sounds like, um, you're, you're using the physicality of it to try to get some, to try to emulate love or to try to invite love into your life. So that approach is a little bit, well, not a little bit, but that approach is misguided. Using your body to make someone stay with you is manipulation. And it's a, a misuse of the the gift that God has given you. Our body is truly a temple and we need to think about it in that way. So that that is that's a manipulation. If you have to coerce someone to stay with you, then you need to love yourself enough to let them leave. Please, please, please get this. If you have to manipulate or coerce or convince someone to stay with you, you need to love yourself enough to let them leave. Because even if they do stay, number one, I don't think it's going to be for long. Number two, it's not going to be healthy. It's not going to be fulfilling. It's not truly going to be love. That love that we talked about earlier that looks like God you're not going to get that if you have to manipulate and coerce someone and entice them by offering up your body in ways that are not pleasing to God. You're not going to get that. So I think we need to ask ourselves, like, what kind of love are we actually seeking? Are we seeking the kind of love that God gives us or are we seeking something else? Are we just trying to get rid of the loneliness? Are we just trying to fulfill this physical and sexual desire? What is it that we're actually seeking? Because if we're clear about what we're looking for, that's going to inform the way that we go after those things. So if right now, the way that you're going after those things is through your body and through lust, then it does not sound like you're actively seeking the kind of love that God wants for you. Now, we know that temptation is real, okay? We know that temptation is real and that a part of what we crave is that that physicality with someone else and so we we have to be aware of that right like sin is all around us and that temptation can be very very real god is not mad at you as long as you're still trying to resist that sin as long as you continue to bring it to him and if you're feeling that godly sorrow and you're really submitting that to him and it's a temptation that you're still continuing to struggle with god knows that you're struggling with that temptation and so he wants to help you through it I think it's when we stop struggling. I think it's when we stop fighting the temptation and when we just give into it and we just let it keep coming into our life and we just let it keep growing. I think that's when God is hurt and disappointed and and that breaks God's heart. So if anything, I think that's, that's when he's unhappy. But if you know that this is a temptation that, that you struggle with and that it's, it's an ongoing thing that you're working through with God, he's not, he's not mad at you and he wants you to keep bringing it to him. But I think that this is one of those things that we feel so ashamed about that we don't bring it to God. I think that that lust and especially when it comes to like sexual activity and physical activity, that is one of the, that that's one of the sins that we look at as bigger than the other ones. And we really shouldn't because all sin is the same in the sight of God. But I think because of that, we don't want to bring that to him as much. And a lot of us struggle with lust. Okay. We are human too. And we have bodies and those bodies have needs. Okay. We all struggle with that. But we have to take that struggle to God, just like we take every other sinful struggle to God. If you're not taking it to him at all, then he's not pleased with that. So as long as you're still taking it to him and asking him to purify you, then he's not mad at you. He's pleased with that. He's not pleased with the fact that you're, that, that you're falling to temptation, but he's pleased with the fact that you are inviting him into it and asking him to help you with it. And then lastly, ask yourself, what do you need to submit to God? You were, you're, you're trying to get some kind of need met. So what is the need that you are trying to meet on your own that you're not allowing God to meet? Is it companionship? Is it emotional connection or emotional intimacy? Is it affection? Is it self-control? Know that God can meet those needs. Maybe you haven't seen him meet them yet. And maybe it's because you have not submitted those things to him. So that will be the last thing. Think about what you need to submit to God and truly, truly surrender those things to him. You got to invite God into this struggle with lust and relationships. I don't think we include him enough in it because we feel like we shouldn't want it, but he wants to help you through it. So you have to let him. 
Okay. Thank you all for being here. Um, again, this, this episode, of course, is really personal for me, like they all are. Um, but I really pray that, that this finds who it needs to find, um, and that this will open up a dialogue and conversation for single Christian women. Um, and I want this to be a safe space for us. Okay. Um, so if that's, if that's you, then talk back to me, right? Let me know if this is what we need. And if, and if we need to create another safe space for us, you let me know because we could find a way to do that too. Okay. As always, thank you so much for watching and for listening. If these are my audio listeners, thank you so much for listening. I love you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Therapy and Prayer. Make sure you're subscribed and following wherever you listen to podcasts. And if the spirit moves you, go ahead and leave us a review. If you want to submit a question to be answered on this show, send us an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com. And make sure you're following us on TikTok at Therapy and Prayer. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you soon.